be with us this evening on Wednesday night. And so we've been dealing with uh, social justice over the last few weeks. We started out with worldliness, dealing with uh, what is worldliness. And worldliness, as we have mentioned over the last several weeks, is this idea that it's not so much do's and don'ts of society as so much as a philosophical edifice constructed based on uh, principles of culture, society. So when we say that we are being worldly, we have gone into dealing with how the world views things, how the world deals with uh, society as a whole, or how it deals with culture. And so it is in this subject, when it comes to social justice, the idea that worldliness has infected the church to such a point that we are allowing the world to tell us how we are to view individuals, how to view groups of people. And so uh, we started out with worldliness, we moved into what is social justice, and we are looking at how over social justice, the CRT, the CRI movements deal and progress in different groups. Uh, we looked at how uh, it's basically oppressed over the oppressor. Uh, basically, we are bound by group identity. Group membership is by and large, though not exclusively trait-based, even if the traits in question are socially constructed to constitute groups. The organizing principle remained primarily trait-based and opposed on people involuntarily. And so, as we looked at last week, the bondage of particular human being into groups should cause us Christians to pause for a moment and think about, is this how we are viewed scripturally? Are we viewed scripturally as groups? No. Or are we viewed scripturally as individuals? And this is important to understand this dynamic in today's society. Because far too many Christians have accepted the popular movement today without taking the time to think if it's biblical. They understand it as a justice and an injustice way instead of understanding it as a group individual idea. So incidentally, differing judgments about what it means to be, be human inform different approaches to race, sexuality, religion, politics, these things cause different discussions and debates in the home, schools, churches, churches, and larger society. So how you view people, especially in the moment we are in, is going to dictate how you look at people or persons in society. As one author put it, the best antidote for the current milieu we find in society is to look backward rather than forward, right? Ecclesiastes 1.9 says there is nothing new under the sun. So this isn't as if the church as a whole has not had to face something like this. We looked at a Psalm 8, 1 through 9 to base ourselves in as an individual. And we asked the question based on Psalm 8, what is man? What is man? And so in the coming weeks, as we've looked back already and in going through, we will deal with this question, what is man, from a biblical point of view, understanding that this is how we are supposed to view humanity. For if you look back to Genesis chapter 1, humanity is central to God's purposes and creation. We are made in the image of God, male and female. The image has often been understood to consist in characteristics intrinsic to humans, such as righteousness and holiness. Mo nowadays, though, the image of God is viewed more or less relationally. How are we to relate to one another? Not so much our characteristics of mankind. However, if we look at these and we begin to dis dis dissect this idea, we've already begun last week and we'll begin to give you different views of 
the image of God in Scripture and what many theologians think they are. But we have to understand the image of God as it relates to humanity. Because how we view the Imago Dei, as it's in Latin, the image of God, is how we're going to view humanity. I mean, questions that we will deal with relating to the composition of human psychology, such as are we dichotomous, trichotomous, or monocotous, the origin of the soul. But if we don't understand these things, they have significant bearing on how we view life, including how we are saved and the origin of human life. So we need to think through this idea of the image of God more clearly and even just begin to start thinking about it because I think this is where we need as Christians to begin to understand what's going on in society. So some passages we looked at last week suggest that fallen people remain in God's image despite the effects of sin. We looked at Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. We looked at Genesis 9, 6. We looked at 1 Corinthians eleven seven. In Genesis 5, 1 through 3, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. Genesis 9, 6 talks about God. It's where we get capital punishment. We were made in the image of God. James 3, 9, therewith blessed be God, even the Father, and therewith cursed be men, which are made at the similitude of God. The image of God. These statements have no bearing, really, on those who are believers or those who are unbelievers. But the question we asked last week, is us being a believer, does that affect the image of God in our lives? Ephesians 4.24 And that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Colossians 3.10, And hath put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. So there is tension in the Bible that there is an image of God in fallen humanity, and there may be or may not be an image of God or a more pronounced image of God in those who are believers. And I asked the question last week, how do we reconcile these verses? I asked the question too, have we even thought about trying to reconcile these verses? I gave three theories that we looked at last week. We looked at the Pelagian theory. The image of God consists in reason and free will. These are possessed by all people, and so are all are still in the image of God. All retain the power of contrary choice after the fall, and all are innately able to do good and respond to the gospel. We looked at classic Arminianism. Uh, it goes a little bit further than Pelagian, but they looked at Genesis 1, 26 through 31, and they too uh, view all people since the fall are made in the image of God. However, they sought to give dominion given to humanity over creation as also part of the image of God. We looked at Luther last week, and his, him and his followers looked at a completely reversed position. He says the image of God is solely based on spiritual qualities. Righteousness, knowledge, and holiness that were lost in the fall. You got, we're just reviewing, so you haven't missed anything. Okay. So consequently, fallen, human, fallen humans retain merely vestiges or remnants of the divine image, while the essence of humanity is unchanged. So this is the mirror opposite of the Pelagian theory of how we are to view the image of God. How does the church at Rome view the image of God? They draw a distinct 
distinction between the image of God and the likeness of God. And if you looked at Roman, I mean Genesis 1.26, which we have looked at quite frequently last week, but Genesis 1.26. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Traditional Catholics look at this verse as image and likeness as two different things. The image of God consists in reason, free will, moral agency, and civic virtues. This is how Roman, traditional Roman Catholics would view the image of God. They were possessed by Adam at creation in the state of pure nature and are inherent to humans. But likeness comes in and they say what likeness is is that at creation God gave a super added gift consisting of holiness and spiritual virtues. This was the likeness of God. So obviously, for them, the traditional Roman Catholic, the image of God is reason, free will, the ability to choose, civic virtues, and the likeness is the spiritual qualities, the holiness and spiritual values. So with the image and likeness of God, the likeness of God allowed humanity uh, in its pure and innocent state the different aspects that we would uh, that would cause us to sin today, such as overindulging ourselves, whether it's uh, sensuality, uh, whether it's sexually, whether it's mentally, the things that would cause us to sin not things that we would not be able to do in moderation, things that would cause us to sin, those things were kept in check in harmony. So what they say at the fall is we lost the likeness and kept the image. <coughs> you, you understand that? We, we lost the likeness. What Roman Catholic, Catholicism, traditional Roman Catholics would teach is we lost the likeness. We lost the spiritual... <laughs> virtues and kept the reason and the free will and all these other things that we just mentioned. So if you think about it, humanity is born, they can and able, were born into this world without the light. Because Adam lost it for humanity, Cain and Abel came into the world, much as you and I, came into the world without the likeness of God, no spiritual qualities. So if you think about this, the problem here then, right, is original sin is looked at as a negative loss, not a positive gain. It, what does this do to sin? It basically minimizes sin, doesn't it? I mean, all, all we've done is just we've just lost spiritual quality. The natural state remains intact. A few remarks about the weaknesses of this position. On, on semantic grounds, the terms likeness and image are actually interchangeable. They're synonyms. So you really, really can't find a difference there. It teaches, if we take what it's talking about, it teaches that the body and soul are in constant conflict. Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, he was the great medieval theologian, 12th century, I think, if I remember correctly. He, does, he said that supernatural grace was required to prevent sinful actions.
And what we've looked at already this, this evening is that it leads to a minimized view of the fall. Human sin led merely to a state of nature, which was not in and of itself sinful, but only potentially sinful. Because, I mean, if you think about it, if the fall was primarily bodily, we lost the idea of righteousness, holiness, the mind was readily less affected. Which is problematic, correct? Because as we look at Scripture, sin has affected every area of our life. Mind, body, soul, affections, thoughts, desires. But you have to hand it to the church at Rome, though, is they try to deal with the tension found biblically. As, with, as opposed to the other three views that look at it as either it's this or that, the physical or spiritual, Roman Catholics try to deal with this view and the tension that is created biblically. But the Reformers come along and they have their own view. Right? As with anything, when the Reformation hit, there was a lot of different views being floated around. The Reformers come along, they had their own view. They also tried to deal with this dualistic aspect, or this tension found in Scripture. They said, they didn't come around and deal with it with image and likeness. They said, broad and narrow. They looked at it as moral agency and moral excellence. Moral agency is the idea that we can choose right and wrong. Moral excellence is dealing with the spiritual aspect. And Calvin, John Calvin would say the proper seed of God's image is in the soul. He says that man's nature was so corrupted that whenever we see the image of God, it is frightfully deformed now in humanity. Ephesians 4.24 again, he says, The beginning of the restoration is obtained in Christ, the second Adam, and he restores us to the true and complete integrity, or the complete uh, image of God at uh, our resurrection body. Ephesians 4.24 again, and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If we think about this, then who is the most perfect image of God? Jesus. Christ. Because if we're continually conformed to him, then we what? Bear his image. The question is, there's also some issues with this as well. A couple of theologians brought up, last century theologians brought up some uh, criticisms to this position, and actually they have gained so much popularity that this is actually the common way we view things today when it comes to the image of God. Because we've not held to this view either today. We don't hear, view the image of God much less of any of these five views so far. And it's because of mainly two individuals, uh, Karl Barth and Louis Birkauer. Because today, we view the image of God relationally. Oh. Instead of looking for... If, particular features that are intrinsic to the soul and particular features that are intrinsic to the body, there has been a drift of thought towards a relational and dynamic categories. I mean, think about it. Uh, when you hear today people representing the image of God, it's mostly how you yourself 
put the image of God to the lost and dying world. How are your testimony, your image? It's the image now consists primarily of how people view you. How do you reflect the glory of Christ? How are you being transformed by the Spirit to be like Christ? He says central to human's existence, Karl Barth, central to human existence is his relationship to God. And he uses Genesis 1, 26 and 27 to help him with that. He says the image of God is humanity's creation as man and woman. He says man is no more solitary than God. In man and woman, he is a copy and imitation of God. Christ is God for us. God is God in Christ. All people are in Christ. Burkauer echoes the same things, minimizes total humanity's depravity, and there's a trend away in reform circles, away from, because Barth and Burkauer are both reformed people in re these reform circles, away from the traditional approach of seeing the image of God. What, what's the problem here, though? Why have we gone from what is intrinsic to the individual to relational? How did we get to this point now? What is the proper view of the image of God? Is it one of the five choices, or is there something different? Have we lost something? What is it? What did the early church have to say about the image of God? We've dealt with Pelagius. He was part of the early church, 5th century, 4th century. We've dealt with uh, Arminian. We've dealt with Luther. Now we're coming into modern history. Athanasius, if you recall from Sunday school, uh, he was the one who stood up against Arianism. We would know Arianism today as Jehovah's Witness. Okay. How they view Christ. Christ is created from God. Jehovah's Witnesses would say the same thing. Arians said the same thing back almost 2,000 years now. Athanasius stood up against them, and he was one of a handful of voices standing up against this heretical teaching about the Trinity. And he connects humanity's creation and the image of God with Christ. And it's a very interesting way he goes about saying the image of God is with Christ. He says that the, he declares that the Son was forever being worshipped by the angels and the whole creation which he had made, right? Christ made creation before he ever became incarnate. And he goes on to say that Christ is the image of God in whom we were created. God did not barely create man, but made them after his own image, which is Christ. Giving them a portion, even the power of, as Athanasius says, his own word. Using the terminology that you would find in John chapter 1, right? And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Athanasius is using this terminology of word. So he says, because of Jesus becoming the Word, we're now a reflection of the Word. We were made to be rational of the Word. We were created by the Word. We are able to partake of the Word. And he would go on to say, he was made man that we might be made God. Now, we would look at that sentence and say that's kind of heretical, but we'll get into this maybe not tonight, but later. St. Peter Chrysologus, 
states the second Adam stamped his image on the first Adam when he created him. That is why he took on himself the role and the name of the first Adam in order that he might lose what he had made in his own image. So John of Damascus states that an image is a likeness of something. Every image makes manifest hidden things since we do not have direct knowledge of the invisible realm. The first image of the invisible God is the Son showing us the Father. John chapter 1, verse 18, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is, the bosom, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Not that any man hath seen the Father, John 6, 46, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. What does Jesus tell the apostles in the upper room in John 14? We know, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and life, no man comes from the Father but by me. Remember, Philip asks a question. Verse 8 and 9, he says, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Jesus says to them, Have I been so long time with you, and yet thou hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Paul tells the church at Colossae, what, chapter 1, verse 15, Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? The writer of Hebrews says in chapter 1, verse 3, he is the express image of his person. Now, again, we mentioned this last week, and it, we're going to. It, the question is: Is why do we have to deal with all of these different theories? Why do we have to deal with this theoretical image of God? We have to get back to a biblical view of God, and some of that has to deal with th us thinking through these things. Because how we view humanity is going to dictate to us how we're going to how we are going to uh, deal with what is going on in social justice. Because we claim that we think that it is an individual person, but what gives that individual person priority? What is it about the person that? We should think of them higher than an animal. And, and far too long we have not thought of people like we should. I mean, I, I mean we could take, for instance, I can ask a question tonight, and I could ask each of, each of you individually, Tonight, and I can ask this myself the same question. If we thought of people the way we're supposed to biblically, should we not then be evangelizing people more? If we thought of people biblically, I could ask the question, when was the last time we did evangelize someone? People are craving an answer to the wrongs and ills of this world. And they think they found it in this movement. But the premise of the movement is all wrong because they put them in groups and not deal with them individually. And as I heard a preacher on Sunday night a lot of the fault that's going on right now is to be blamed in the church house. Because we have not done our job to love people properly, to view humanity properly. And so it is important for us to learn these things as we move forward so that we can 
do what is expected of us. So forth. Thank you for joining us by Facebook Live. If you have any questions, feel free to put them in the comment section. We'll try to get back to you. And again, for you all seated here tonight, questions, comments, thoughts.